If you want a sub 10 average, you must first water the plants. I if you want motivational <laughs> And the podcast right here, that's it. That's the only advice you need. <laughs> Like that's that's actually gonna be your intro, your segue into the intro. Oh yeah, then, you're right. There we go. There's there's the clip. Hey there, everyone. What's up? Welcome back to another episode of your favorite speed cubing podcast, Over Inspected. As always, you're, it's your host Manu. Today, back with the boys, Carrie and Michael. How's it going, guys? Good to see you again for another podcast episode of the greatest speed cubing podcast in the world i think it's been a couple episodes since we said that so just to remind you all yes this is the greatest speed cubing podcast in the world anyway what's up guys i'm pretty excited for the uh for the topic today today we're gonna talk about um kind of like practice and uh how you should efficient like well things that we picked up over time on how is like the best way to practice um we're also going to talk a little bit about like how to keep like this guy the mental strong um while you're like doing practice and as you go and grind for you know those prs and records so yeah you guys got any thoughts about practicing Do you, like i remember one episode a while ago we talked about how our practice habits have changed since we I, I, or like as we've gotten older i think i mentioned that like i i used to just like just grind mindlessly i would just like do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again um, but now, like, as I've become older, I've realized, like, if I want to seriously, um, improve in something, instead of just doing, like, you know, mindless practice, it needs to be more targeted practice. So, what, what do you guys think? What is your experience with this kind of stuff? Um, I think targeted practice is obviously going to reap more benefits, and I think, like, if someone sees themselves as, as, like, a professional speed cuber, it's like, that's the training that'll really pay off. Mm. Um, I feel like as I've gotten older, I still haven't been able to get out of the mindset of like, oh, I'm just gonna cube to relax. And I don't wanna like work too hard. I like kind of creating like a game plan feels like too much effort sometimes. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's true. I, like, cause yeah. I, at the end of the day, as we mentioned in the advice to newer cubers, it's like, you know, you should have fun with it, right? So. If putting on a practice regimen makes you want to quit speed cubing, then you should probably not put, go on to an insane practice regimen. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think that it is more fulfilling when you like put a little more effort to kind of organize what your game plan is, and then you see rewards. So, like, you know, I don't think that will make someone resent speed cubing. It just is a little bit of a higher hurdle to get over at the beginning. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of that quote what was that quote like good things never come easy or like uh something something don't quit i don't know if um not sure i think the, there are probably several there are like just good motivational quotes um but i mean what carrie said is interesting in a sense that um you know it's a it's a lot of work to to try and improve like to actively make an effort to improve is a ton of work and this is where you start to parse the difference with how people learn, right? Some people are naturally very good at not making the same mistake twice. However, I'm not one of those people. Uh, so when I solve a three by three, um, if I make a mistake, uh, if I solve enough to all pair a certain way, and I know it's not the right way or not a better way, more efficient way, um, I might just do it again if I just spam and just don't think too much about it. However, um, there are some other keepers that wouldn't have that issue like oh I screwed up here Let me do it right the next time and guess what they do it right the next time and it never looked back um, right, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of effort that's involved for some people to improve um, And that's something that I've developed over um, The years a little bit to improve more strategically rather than improve mindlessly um, because just grinding out a ton of solves doesn't work for me quite as much as some other people um yeah i don't know i'm trying to think of that motivational quote um, uh yeah no no I, I know what you're talking about it's um it, it goes something like i think like like if you is it the teach no, a man to fish quote or not it, it could be i mean Maybe. in theory you're, te you're teaching them a skill stuff like that rather than teaching them uh or, no no, no. Yeah. It, uh, it's i i almost have it what is it it's um like i think it's like if if you want to reach the summit, you must first cross the river. You know that one. 
Have you guys ever yeah, heard of that, that one? <laughs> sounds like, uh, you know, A plus B equals C. <laughs> for any philosophical quote. So, this is running gag between me and Fikin. Um, so, you can make anything sound like a philosophical quote by saying A plus B equals C. Now, the reason why it's A plus B equals C is because A has no relation to B, which has no relation to C. Just like math, right? A, B, and C are all individual like variables. So, for example, in order to meet the crossroads, you must juggle a thousand bulldogs. See, it sounds it sounds so deep, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that makes sense. But in the end, it's just pure nonsense. It's just a template that you know you just you just come up with. Quotes by yeah. chat. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, think it, we should. It reminds uh, me of the, the AI that generates motivational posters. Um, <laughs> because I, yeah. like, it'll probably fool people who are who just want to have that like motivational aesthetic, but there's like no actual meaning. Right, right, right. Dude, you know what? We should we should like generate a bunch of these, right? And then we should like put them on like on like t-shirts or something and sell them as like Cooper's Live merch. Like, like if you want oh, to achieve, I... if, if you want to get sub 10 average, you must first water the plants or so just something absolutely ridiculous. That one's good. That one, <laughs> that one feels like it has substance. Maybe, I don't know. Like I just, I just told like, see like this is just something that I, I just totally pulled out of my head because it's just like, all I need is like, it just needs to be in this exact format and it'll just sound cool and interesting. So that, 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 that's if you maybe. Want... Maybe that this maybe this is good for your practice motivation, right? Like, just remember that if you want if you want a sub ten average, you must first water the plants. So, I if you want motivational. And the podcast right here. That's it. That's the only advice you need. <laughs> like that's that's actually gonna be your intro, your segue into the intro. Oh yeah, then, you're right. There we go. Yeah, there's, there's the cue, cue the music. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh my god. Um. Okay, but um, I I remembered the quote. It was not related to quitting. Uh, no pain. No gain. Okay, yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. okay, that one's yeah. really short. Very short. No pain, um, no gain. So if you've ever heard of that, I took a class um, in college that was that talked about like the origin of that phrase. Oh yeah. Um, oh really? In, in Greek, it's pathe mathos, and okay. and like pathe means like pain, is like psychopath mm. or like sociopath, and then mathos is like calculation or like planning. So okay. it's like. I, I, okay, I might be getting this wrong because the class was like three years ago, but people have been saying no pain, no gain for thousands of years. Thousands of years, yeah. Very interesting. I mean, maybe it's because it works. I mean, maybe. no pain, no gain. Um, very, yeah. Anyways, we're, we are rambling about what, you know, what quotes that we recall, but there, you know, there is a method to the madness. Um, I guess I could kind of, I don't know, Manu, if you want to kind of like jump in on this, but I can kind of explain what worked for me recently. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's I, a great idea. Because you're, yeah, especially, I, I, that, this, so I think we came up with this episode because you have been going ham on Mega recently and it has results. Like everyone can see these results now too. It's like totally public results. So yes, please, please go into it. Yeah, it was a pretty long grind, but um, I think it's kind of similar to mean of 10, average of 5. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially what it did, it was an average of 100 every single session that it did. Um, now, the reason why that detail is important is um, basically I do 100 solves of the day and then whatever that average is, is what I average for the day, right? Um, and I think that's a good way for me to think about it. I, I'm pretty used to always starting a new session anyways. Um, but setting it to 100 specifically um, has it's some pros and cons. The pros, obviously, is I'm seeing a lot of solves. So I'm doing mm. a lot of solves. I'm working on my look ahead, right? Um, another pro to that is I'm because of that, I'm able to see a lot of different PLLs, understand a lot of OLLs, things that are very repetitive, not like F2L, where F2L can be kind of like, who, who knows what it's going to be on the very next pair, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. right. um, the cons to that is it takes forever. Um, and this is a con and a pro, but you have to think about it. The con is that because it takes forever, your solve 60 is going to be significantly different from your actual performance in your solve one because of the fatigue factor. Um, but this is where I started to turn this into an exercise. What I did was I tried to solve through that fatigue. Like it was actually tiresome. So mm -hmm. by being able to maintain my performance on solve 70, solve 85 compared to solve 20, um, I was able to kind of hit this zone. And then by the time I pick up my first solve, 
when I go to complete an average, boom, I get a 36. And that's really cool. Like, and with like no warm up whatsoever. It just right, kind of so happens. I, I guess it's kind of just like, it, it's like you're, you're, you're practicing what it's like to be tired, kind of. Like, well, this is not exactly the same thing, but every single time, like, I always go back to this fight. It's Rock Lee versus Gara, right? When, like, he takes off the, um, he takes off the ankle weights, and then, like, you know, he, he becomes, like, much, much faster. So it's kind of like, yeah. uh, in some sense. I, I was thinking of the, the, like, football athletes who train at a high altitude with, like, low oxygen. Yep, mm. exactly. Like, they come back down to, like, sea level, and they're, like, superhuman. What was the, uh, the location? Denver. So Denver teams oh. have an altitude advantage. Right. Um, so Denver yeah. teams generally play really good at home because their opponents get a little bit more winded later, you know, in, in the games. I don't know if there's a Denver baseball team. Denver Orioles? Baltimore no, Orioles. No, they're, they're the Colorado Denver... Rockies. Oh, Colorado Rockies. The, the Rockies okay. are in. I think, I'm pretty sure they're in Denver. Denver Broncos and the uh, Denver Nuggets. So, um, they do have a advantage at least in like regular season games i'm not gonna say too much about postseason um but yeah that's essentially what it was um i think the other advantage to it was to keep me level-headed because i'm not very level-headed um sometimes you're just gonna have a bad solve and sometimes you're gonna right. have two or three if you have a hundred solves chances are like 10 11 12 who knows maybe even 20 of them suck um, and they, because they suck, and you had more than one, that's going to significantly affect your overall average. So the question is, can you still hit the average that you're trying to hit with a solve that's significantly slower than what you're capable of? And if you can, that means you're actually faster and you're capable of being faster than what you actually are. Right, right, because right. Because you're, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. able to average it out, right? So mm -hmm. you have a lot of potential for singles. So... Like for me, my goal was consistently sub 50, but if I had a lot of one minute solves, it was significantly harder to get that sub 50. Um, now, obviously I should just do a better job of being consistent, but you know, it's, I think it's also a sign crumbles. That, like when you go to competition and you can get an average of five that doesn't have any of those, you know, minute solves, then you actually average lower than 50 in competition. Exactly. Yeah, as long exactly. As you, yeah, avoid avoid the mines essentially. What's the what's the you, basically are you able to hit your average? Are you able to hit your goals with a huge amount of data points, right? Mm. Like yeah. your distrib I don't know what's it called, like your distribution of solve. Sure, whatever. sure. But um yeah, so that's what I did on my streams for a while. That's what I did for Megaminx and it has worked for me for an extent. I've taken a break. I've been trying to casually solve seven by seven to work on my dexterity and look ahead so maybe that could be a future all right sure. you know, little sure. thing i can get feedback on whatever you say look, man. we all we look, all know you're really trying to look, we all know you're really trying to torture yourself that's really I'm what's averaging right five minutes 30 seconds when i was averaging eight so guys we're getting there it's happening i'm not doing six by six i'm not doing five by five i'm just doing seven by seven wrong answer Chai, so, clearly you did not pay attention to the last episode where i absolutely destroyed seven by seven and without and now, without a doubt, it will be the next one to get removed by the WCA. <laughs> oh, so all your oh, practice is going to oh be in my... vain. <laughs> no, I it's not going to be in vain because it's going to translate to six by six and five by five. Well, we're getting rid of six by six things, then it's going to go. <laughs> I, no, no, I yeah. Say, yeah, I, yeah. I ha um, it's good to have a friend, like a fellow friend, who is also bad at seven by seven because my times in the WCA website are not good. Oh, so, but like, mine are horrendous. Like, my, like I'm surprised that Chai was even worse than me at seven by seven. Like, I only got a mean once because I think like the competition just didn't have like any cumulative limit or whatever. So I was just like, okay, this is my opportunity to get the mean and just get it on my profile so that I never have to do this again. And since that day, I don't think I've ever competed in seven by seven. So, oh, okay, this, I see. This well, now I see why you want to remove it. Right? Yeah, because I've done I this. See you and I see flexing seven by sevens. Oh man, but I don't know. Do, I, I'm actually genuinely curious, uh, Carrie. I'm curious about how you tackle uh, big blind and like if there's any mm. sort of strategy that you do. But just if you guys have like a different approach in general for practicing. Yeah, I feel like practicing for the blind events is very different from the sighted events because half of a blind solve is memo, right. which like doesn't have as much like 
technical ways you can like shave off seconds. Like with three by three, you learn all these finger tricks and ways to sort of like avoid regrips and rotations and all that. For memo, you just like get faster the more you do it because you're just more familiar with like, oh, this letter is here and this piece needs to go here. So I almost feel like getting from like a five minute average to a one minute average was nothing but just rote practice. For, for three blind? Um, you know, with, with three blind. <laughs> I mean, with four blind, <laughs> like, it's, it's different. But what um, makes it different? Uh, I think, well, okay, only one person in the world averages one minute with four <laughs> blind. <laughs> Which is crazy. <laughs> I, I think, um, I'm sort of at a plateau with, like, big blind right now because I still haven't done targeted practice on, like, just X centers or just plus centers, mm. you know, because I want to, you know, do a whole solve and, like, get a good time on, like, a like an official looking four blind. Um, but I think if you want to get, like, faster than, like, sub four four blind or maybe, like, sub three, that's when you need to start, like, focusing on one piece type because then you can, like, more easily identify, like, which commutators are the ones I really struggle with here right. and, like, kind of laser focus on, like, fixing those. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I guess, like, to take, like, it's kind of a step back, like, we're not necessarily talking about, like, if, like, if you can do four or five blind or three blind, it's more like if you're, like, learning how to and learning how to even do it in the first place, then I think what's interesting is, like, at least when I started learning three blind and four blind is I would actually do a lot of targeted piece practice. I would do, like, only, only centers or, like, I would only do wings because I think to this day, wings are still like the hardest piece for me because they're they're 24 pieces they are all over it's very hard to like track and see like which ones are done which ones are not done so like i would just i, I would do pieces only and i would just have several solves where i would do um like centers memo centers execution um wings memo wings execution and then uh corners memo corners execution and it, just in that order and then i would like take take the blindfold off make sure like everything is right you know, check and see, like, okay, like, what, what went wrong? Um, sometimes with blind, it's hard to tell, like, if you're, if you're off by, like, a slice or something, then everything just looks like total chaos. It's just like, okay, well, this was a complete disaster. But sometimes it can be like, okay, like, like, there was one I was doing earlier where I was supposed to visit Deborah's, I think, her, wait, no, so I ended up visiting Deborah's grandmother, but instead I was actually supposed to meet her elephant instead, and I just, like, uh, oh, like like it, it was like one piece. It's like it's a one piece swap, right? So then I can look at the cube and be like, oh, like this is stupid. Like oh, I should not have done G. I was supposed to do E instead. So yeah, so, yeah. Sometimes you can do things like that, and I feel like doing, um, like single piece practice can help with things like that. But then again, maybe this is just complete nonsense because no. no. it took like twenty one attempts for me to get. No, it took me. It took twelve attempts for me to get four blind, and I still don't have five blinds. Um, well, I, I do agree. Like, I think targeted practice is the way to go um, at all levels. Um, and, and the thing you mentioned about sort of getting the letter pairs flipped around, I think this is something that, like, uh, people need to sort of, like, sort out in their head if they want to get really fast. Like, if you... For me, I remember this happened with, like, my four blind PB that... I was trying to remember Spongebob at night, like mm -hmm. SB and NI, but I couldn't remember if it was like NISB or SBNI. Uh. And I think if you have like a very uh, routine way of like, oh, always do the time before the subject, then you'll never miss that again in a future mm. song. Oh. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, but I like, never, it's I not never fun developed to... anything like that. So like mine are just yeah. like completely random. They'll just be totally like random things where like sometimes the adjective will come after, sometimes the adjective will come before. And I guess like I just count on like my short term memory to just like just just cram it all in there yeah. and just figure it out. Like you sort of just have have a feeling like, oh I remember that the adjective came after and was like it you know, it just it's gonna feel that Actually, way. Actually, no, I, I remember adjective. one case. Um, I don't know if this was, this might have been during an official solve, but I remember, so I think I had Europe and Brown. I think it was EU and probably like B, BW, probably. Or maybe, maybe it was BR. Well, see, I don't even know. Well, that's kind of a problem. But in any case, um, I think it was Europe and Brown. And when I was doing memo, sometimes I would say, oh, it's Brown Europe. But then I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. So I think what I did is I ended up like having Europe, like I like imagine like a map of Europe. 
And then I like as I went, I was coloring it in brown. So that kind of helped me. Like okay, like first I start with Europe, and then it becomes brown over time. So then it's like so, okay, so like now start this provides brown. the the temporal order, if you will. So brown wasn't an adjective; it was a verb because the map browned. Oh well, I was thinking it got colored brown. So in that case, oh, it was it, it was an adjective, but it, it's the same thing. Yeah, it did all it did brown. I it guess it was turned brown. Yes, yes. Um, um, but yeah, anyway, I think, um, so some, some other things for, for practice that I used to do, um, is like, I would do a lot of, I think, and I think we mentioned this as well, like doing untimed solves, I think helps, helps way more than, especially for like at a beginner level than you might think. Um, it's weird because like when you sit down to do like a time solve right there's like a weird like mental thing for me where it's like okay like this is a time solve like you know i need to do it in like a particular way or whatever and that kind of just like changes the way that i think i see certain things on the cube sometimes i will like kind of like focus in on like particular pieces more um instead of like kind of just like looking around and seeing like something more general i'll just miss things but like in a when i'm doing like more of like a casual solve where I'm not worried about the time sometimes I'll think more about like okay like this is the next thing I need to do what is an efficient way for me to do this like is the way that I would do in a speed solve necessarily the like a good way to do it in the future and sometimes like I would just mess around with like different inserts this is this, this is particularly for F2L uh, I would mess around with like different inserts and see if you know is, is there like a better way to do it is there more is there like you know less moves or more finger trick friendly and that I think helped me a lot when I was learning. Do, do you guys have thoughts on, on this? Maybe you tried it yourself. Yeah, I'm, I think um, when it, when it's a time solve and I, I get to a case that like I told myself in the past I'm gonna use this more efficient algorithm, um, but the timer's running and I I, I can't like think of that new right. algorithm quick enough. I'll just resort to the old one. Right, right. And that's just like. Like further sets in stone the fact that I will never switch to the new alg unless I make it a point to sacrifice those like three seconds to do the alg that I'm less comfortable with. Right, because you, you don't want to sack like if it's if it's time solved, right? And you you just you don't want to sack like let's say you got like a really good um, F2L or whatever, and like now you're on this OLL and you know you've been practicing. Let's say you've been practicing CP, and you're on the you're on the OLL. You know you could take time to recognize the CP and give yourself a better case, but like. Oh, why would you do that? You know, my F two O is already really good. If I just like, if I, if I just do what I did, I'll get a faster time anyway, right? Um, so yeah, the, the, I think like for for learning algs, it makes a lot of sense to like just take away the timer, just slow down co completely, and just just do the do some solves over and over, and like just like let yourself, um, I I guess like let, let yourself kind of get used to like putting these algorithms in your solves. Yeah. yeah. Well, th this is like um slightly devil's advocate uh, mm -hmm. but i think in the future we're we've already dedicated an episode topic entirely on this for an, a future podcast um but there is a world where you don't need to be a hundred percent at the most efficient um and if your solution is efficient enough you can counteract it with right. some turns per second so like for example um, and then this is something that plays well, like you could save your move count by doing a more efficient last layer, but do you actually want to be more efficient if that takes away the amount of time that you need to actually recognize the case and execute the case? Because oftentimes those cases are also less ergonomic. Um, right. And yeah. for a, a classic example is COLL. So people use COLL for the recognition of corners, but not necessarily for COLL 100% because COLL tends to not be very ergonomically friendly for some some cases. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, a uh, very, very important skill to know is to not stress too much about your time. Like, it's definitely a skill. Uh, there's a lot of people that look down on their timer. Um, I remember Paul was like, one of the things that he did to improve is to stop looking at his timer while he was solving. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing where I feel and you know, this is a thing where I have to break my way of thinking. I know that my centers on seven by seven building one bar at a time doesn't work in the most efficient sense. Right. But if I constantly time it, I'm never going to break down my center solving 
and think of a better solution. Um, I just tend to think that I'm efficient enough. Um, but truthfully, I haven't hit that stage yet where I don't know what it's called, but basically I haven't hit that stage of efficiency where I can stop caring. You know mm. what I mean? But I feel confident that I'm efficient enough, but it's just like my ego talking, really. I should, you know, stop timing my seven by seven solves and work on my centers, but I have not yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's it, it's also just like, you know, if you wanted to come up with like the most efficient solution, then you would just do FMC, right? Like that, like but and clearly, take like forever at it. yeah, exactly. Like it would it would take it would well it would it would take an hour or more, right? Where like, but like if you just want to like get get a solution done and you want to do it quickly, then like you you need to like balance off like. Okay, like, you know, I'm going to do these moves because th there might be way more moves, but I can execute them quickly and, you know, and, th you know, they aren't that bad. Like, I can I can still see what's going to what's going to happen in the next uh, in, in the next stage or two stages down or whatever. So I think that's an interesting, interesting topic. And yeah, I think we will definitely come back to um, like move efficiency um, in, in a future episode. Yeah. Oh, something I wanted to bring up. Is that Michael? When you're talking about like you're not sure if you've like reached this like threshold where you're efficient enough. Threshold. That was the word. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, it reminded, it reminded me of this topic in AI and computer science. So Manu, I don't, maybe you've heard of it. It's exploiting versus exploring. Yeah. 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 And, and like, it's sort of like with an AI, it has to spend the first few stages just exploring the options and getting feedback of like, oh, going that direction leads to a very low reward, but that one leads to a high reward. But after enough iterations, it's like, it has a good enough sense of the general layout that it can exploit what it knows is the best option. And it doesn't need to kind of branch right. out as much. It can just like stay in its grooves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for for, 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 for like you nerds out there, like um, I think one thing that was very interesting um, was I think, I think it might have been OpenAI. I think OpenAI did, did a lot of stuff with like um, with like old time like Atari games, and one of them one of the interesting strategy was figured out by an AI playing Breakout. And if you've never played Breakout, it's a game where like there's a bunch of like tiles at the top. There's a little like bar at the bottom. The bar moves back and forth, and the ball like bounces. But every time it bounces the thing, it like comes back down. You have to keep hitting it back and forth without letting the ball fall to the ground. Um, and one thing that was really interesting is that like that an AI eventually learned to. Like basically, like create like so. If this is like the, like the block, like the big block of blocks, eventually, like the AI learned that like okay, if I make like a vertical hole in it, and then I send the ball like into that hole, it can bounce around and then bounce around up like at the top, and you know there's zero probability of failure because it's just bouncing around at the top. So like this is like an extremely like good thing to do. So that, that that's like one thing like you know you have to be able to explore that option. Whereas like you know one thing that people probably do is that like. They might try like breaking the blocks layer by layer, um, and you know that that's something that you can try as well. But yeah, like having the like exploration versus exploitation, it's like okay, like I need to like go and like see like what different strategies are out there, try a bunch of stuff out, even if it sounds kind of stupid. Then it's like okay, like now that I've learned this, I'm just gonna abuse this and just use this to uh, use it to my advantage. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Manu, when you were talking about the the breakout game, I thought you were gonna talk about. Maybe it was a different experiment, but an AI was learning how to play video games, mm -hmm. and eventually, when it was in a situation where it was destined to lose, it would just pause the game. Forever. Oh, yeah, really... I've heard about that one. Yeah, That's yeah, like, just because like... it was the only way to not lose. Yeah, <laughs> which is like kind of philosophical. <laughs> like, yeah, the only <laughs> there you go. The the only way to win is to not play. <laughs> exactly. That's, I mean... that's the quote. The only way to win is to not play, but also it sounds like what I would do when I threw hissy fits um, <laughs> when I was losing in Chinese chess. Like I would play Chinese chess with my grandpa a lot and I would stop playing. Um, and I got yelled at for that, so I stopped doing that. Because <laughs> I was being bad man. Bad man. Accept okay. the loss. Take yeah. the L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Clearly I wasn't using a chess timer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. So, so I think we, we spent a good good portion talking about practice habits and ho hopefully you've learned a little bit from there. But I think another thing that's very interesting, and I think it like it plays together very well, uh, I want to talk a little bit about like how to keep like the mental sharp while you're practicing because I know this has happened to me very, like it's happened to me a lot where like I'll be practicing, you know, sometimes like maybe let's, let's say I did like 50 solves and then, you know, I have a stretch of good solves, which is like, all right, yeah, feels good. You know, like I'm really improving, but then you get a, like, 
a stretch of bad solves, or you know, you're you're ending on like solves that are like not really that good. And I was just like, okay, well, this really sucks. Like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. So I think it would it would be interesting if we discuss like different different practice habits that you can have in order to like keep like your your mental game also up. And I think we can also discuss a little bit about how it relates to like competition nerves and stuff. I think all of these are kind of all related. Maybe some of these can get thrown into a different episode, but. Yeah, what, what do you guys do whenever like you you're like solving and you know it feels you know you, you're you're doing pretty well and then like all of a sudden you just hit like a roadblock and it's just like it just seems like every single solve is just it's just getting like worse and worse or you know it's just like not even close to where your goal is hmm it's a good question i i feel like the right thing to do is is like take a break and then i go on a walk and come back mm -hmm. but i can never get myself to do that because like my brain is like, I want to replace these bad souls with good souls, like now. Right. Um. So I feel like the the person with self control would take a break. Um, but what if know. you can't take a break? What if you're in the middle of an average? average oh, I mean, or maybe it's a competition result, right? Like maybe you know, it's first a two souls are done. Like yeah, two souls are no, bad. No, but it's a realistic well, scenario. I mean, I still. I feel like if it's like you do a hundred souls and it's split with breaks in the middle, but it's still in one day, I would still. Call that an average of 100? No, nope, wrong answer, wrong day. answer. That's, no, 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 oh no. no. Nope, fake average of 100. Well, I don't buy no, it. No, but that that's literally like how I define the average of 100. Like part in of the reason sitting. it was, in, yeah, it was literally one sitting. Yeah. Right? Well, that, like, then, like, what do I average in a moment? Yeah. yeah the, the no, no, no fake like, average of 100s here, unlike Cuber Stash. That guy, that guy <laughs> I've called you out. Well, okay. <laughs> Averages of 100 are only for like at home personal use anyway, so it, it doesn't matter. Unless you had twenty rounds of three by three, how many competitors oh. does that require? A lot. <laughs> that would be <laughs> an someone do absurd the math. number. I think. If, if every round halved the population, you'd need at least a million. Yeah. Because two to the twenty is about a million. Really? Yeah. But, yeah. I hate how you knew yeah. that answer so quickly. <laughs> well, two, two to the well, ten is about a thousand, so you just yeah, it. yeah. So yeah, you just I, I guess so. Yeah. Well, okay, uh, that's uh, getting off topic. Well, we, we, can, um, we can do that maybe. Maybe Worlds one day. 20 <laughs> rounds of 3 Yeah. Three. Yeah. Um, but okay, so back on the topic of what to do when bad solves arise. I don't know. I guess like turn a little bit slower just to sort of like yeah. calm any frustration. Yeah, I, I've definitely tried that. And it's like... Sometimes, because for me, whenever I get a bad solve, usually it's because like I am, I'm like not looking looking ahead well enough, and it's like, okay, and, and it ends up manifesting itself as like a lot of pauses. So one thing that I have have tried, and it's it's worked, I think, reasonably well. Uh, I think it worked better when I was uh, slower, like, um, like probably probably like more than more than thirty seconds era. But I think it what what was what worked really well was like okay, you know, like instead of just like immediately deciding instead of just like you know just trying to spam tps i'm gonna work on my efficiency actually but i'm gonna work on my efficiency kind of like live and it, instead of just like okay like i know the solution i'm gonna do this i'm gonna like do to do the turns deliberately slowly and try and focus on other pieces and try and see where those pieces are going to end up and i think that worked pretty well but there's always the pitfall that i fall into where I just end up solving slowly, but then just not really paying attention to the other pieces, and then it just ends up being just trash tier, which kind of sucks. Oh, I, I don't know if you knew you're muted. I don't even know if the podcast is gonna know you're muted. But I, oh, I no, I was, yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I muted I myself. Think... I was talking to like my dad just got home. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Nice, nice. Um, um, let me think about it. So, when I have a bad solve, and this is like kind of tying into what i was talking about earlier i have been trying to just try harder Interesting. <laughs> I mean, Interesting. like try, literally try strategy to yeah. success if you suck try harder <laughs> yeah i feel like I mean, <laughs> try hard being a try hard works for like strength sports because it's like just gotta push through it and just go like ah <laughs> yeah yeah but like cubing has too much kind of finicky like dexterity and like if you try too hard you'll like pull the cube apart or something <laughs> no it's very true i just you know it's like uh the don't think just solve thing just like yeah, yeah. You know, that max's quote 
Um, but that's the bandwagon that I've been trying to ride. Um, as far as, like, what if I, like, have a bad solve, like, in a competition? Like, how do I stay level-headed? I think a lot of people have, like, various routines that they do. But what I try to do is not have a backup cube to fidget. Okay, interesting. Kind of, kind of forces me to not think so much about the next solve that's about to come. That's um, interesting. I have a... Yeah, I've developed a pretty good track record of not having a terrible solve after a terrible solve, um, just in a normal competition setting. Mm -hmm. um, oh. It's a little bit. I, I had you know problems with like really good solves carrying that over, but that's probably a little bit different. But for the most part, I just try to not have a backup cube. Sometimes just clean my mind of the solve. That's that's um, interesting. Huh. Underrated. So this is just a sidebar. Um, but basically, <laughs> you, you're, uh, so, you're self-aware about this now, so that, I, I'm glad yeah. about that. Anyways, um, every cuber should have a stack map. Um, because if you don't have a stack map, um, your times don't translate to competitions very well. Yes, exactly. You should all have stack maps because if you solve with your keyboard, if you solve with your touch screen, or whatever non-stack map method that you do to solve a cube, you're not gonna have the muscle memory to start and stop the timer. Um, and then it's just weird, like you're still touching a puzzle when you're stopping keyboards, stuff like that. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. And then that's the difference between like 0 0.01 seconds, 0 0.1 seconds, 0 0.2 seconds when you're in an official comp. And when you're fast enough, like when you're 10 seconds, even when you're 12 or 15 seconds, that matters. Yeah. Um, you need to be more confident with the equipment that you use. I remember um, Keon Mansour, like the Rue guy, said that like when he would practice with keyboard, you know how Rue ends with like LSE with a lot of like M mm -hmm. flicks, mm -hmm. like he would stop the keyboard with like his ring finger here just to kind of like press it out like that. Oh, interesting. And he would find that like even in competition, he would be doing that motion at the end of the solve, even though like he should be just using the stack mat. It so, is very um, under, yeah, very yeah. underrated how much your habits of stopping a timer can affect your official competition results. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So I, I know that Keon like switched and now I think he's of the philosophy that like a fit, like uh, personal PVs don't count unless you use a stack map. Like that's how important it is. Interesting. For sure. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think that's highlights pretty much the essential problem. Uh, just like cubing, starting your timer is muscle memory. Especially when you do thousands and thousands and thousands of solves. Yeah, so. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, on this like a little bit of competition, there was probably the last last point that we'll wrap up. Like, I, I guess like so. Chai mentioned that he doesn't use backup cubes. Carrie, what is your go-to method to cooling comp competition nerves? Um, well, I would say that like, I think it's interesting that Michael mentioned the no backup cube because like, I have tried it. And I haven't, like, I don't think it's helped me, so maybe I should try not using a backup cube. No, 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 it's very, like, I should clarify. I have a backup cube all the time. It's just whether or not I turn it. Right, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I find that it helps me to just stop, you know, stop my brain, you know, shut it off for, like, 0.5 seconds, mm -hmm. you know? Try to talk to the person next to me rather than figuring yeah. out and, you know, being hyper-focused. Yeah, trying to like like fool your brain that like oh none of this matters yeah exactly <laughs> we're just yeah. like back in the living exactly. room the, the yeah, copium, exactly yeah <laughs> yeah the yeah. copium like that's cap <laughs> yeah like w when you've done like four solves and you know it's good it's probably not a good idea to try to calculate like the best possible average you could get and what you need for that i know that like a lot of the top yes, keepers do that because yeah. they want to know mm -hmm. but it puts so much pressure on like the last few moves of your last solve that like I, I've seen way too many times like someone knows they need to get like a like a five point seven, and then they fumble fum, fumble up the last few moves. And yeah, get like a five point nine. Yeah, yeah, and th this kind of happened to me in in Mill Valley um, a couple weeks ago. Like it was it was this clock, and it's just like okay, like you know, like the clock is like literally the only event I care about. So, and at the time, like there it was like in the morning, so there was not much to do. People people were still like filtering in, and. You know, while doing clock, I was just like pacing around and I was just thinking about, okay, like, yeah, I just had clock on my mind the whole time. And then I, I was just thinking about it and then I just go do the solves. All the solves are like pretty, pretty like relatively rubbish solves. 
And it's just like, okay, well, maybe I should have done something else. Like, if I if I was going to get bad solves anyway, I might as well have, like, talked to someone, you know, just, like, you know, ask someone how, how their day was going, you know, like, chill, chill with some of my friends. If that had gotten bad solved, then it's just like, okay, like, you know, no harm, no foul, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense to just like kind of like step up, step back from it all like and just be like, okay, like, you know, this is plastic puzzle at the end of the day, like, you know, we're we're here to have fun and we're going to get we're going to get good results regardless and not think about it too much. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing like your mental game is largely predicated on expectation, right? Mm -hmm. And um that's kind of like a beauty and a curse, expectations. Um, it's why I respect Max a lot, because I like whether or not Max is aware of it or not, like he constantly battles expectations and yeah. exceeds it. Um, that was a huge problem, like for better, for worse, for Felix, right? Um, like competition nerfs. Um, yeah, and Max is just really good at it. But to be honest, I mean, like, you know, there are even moments that there's just so much expectation that even Max can't handle it. Um, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, such a curse. Like, I yeah. think that's kind of what happened a little bit in, uh, World Championships 2019? 2019? Mm -hmm. Is that the one where, like... Sebastian Fire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, like, Max... It was the one that, um, the documentary... Is it... The Speed yeah. Tubers? It, it was I have, I've seen it now. Oh, there we yeah. go! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! yeah. yeah. Nice, we, nice. Uh, I remember... Character development! Yeah, yeah. This is, <laughs> I, I know, like, it's happening it's live, like, like of week time. by week. Oh my goodness. Um, so so I, I know that, you know, Felix and Max were like, I guess rooting each other on, but neither of them actually podiumed, mm -hmm. but it was like really close. And yeah. it, I don't know, it's, it's like times that would typically get you first place were getting you like sixth place. Mm -hmm. You know, I gotta say that 2019 World Championships and like, I, I want to hear your whole opinion about the Netflix documentary, maybe in like in a quick synopsis, but that championship was so close. Yeah. Like people were within yeah. like point oh, one, one seconds of each other. Yeah. Yeah. Point oh, as close point as one. Get. Yeah. It's like six point, it ranged from like 6.8 to 6.9. Nice. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was epic. Yeah. yeah. I, I think in terms of like taking this back to like the mental game, it's, it's like, you know, keeping your head up and staying confident even when you are placing like sixth place. Because it's like, you know, fake it till you make it. You'll only like rise back to first if you feel like you deserve that. Right. And even if you don't, that's fine. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's not even just about like first, right? It's just like, it, because I think like what's cool about cubing is like, yeah, you can compete for first. But the, the important thing is that you're really competing with yourself. It's like, like, yeah. like you know, I, I can be better than this. And it's like, okay, like, I, I deserve this, right? That, that's always, like, the first step, as opposed to just showing up being like, okay, like, yeah, I don't really know what's going on. So, yeah, but I think th yeah. those are just our brief thoughts. I think we will almost certainly come back to this topic in the future, because I think there, there are, like, a lot of interesting things to, to talk about with the mental game. That's what makes cubing a very interesting sport in my mind, is that, like, you know, there's... There, there's a lot of like things that like what's going on up up in your head can affect what's going on like not like in your fingers but like there's a lot of, like visual stimulus and stuff too that I think there's a lot of like interesting factors I don't know I'm saying the same thing over and over again which means that it's time to end the podcast um, hopefully you enjoyed this one I think this was a pretty cool episode I've, we've been meaning to talk about this for a while so yeah hope you all enjoyed and um, from Manu, Carrie, and Chai, this has been. I'm realizing now this has been the Glasses podcast this week. So, uh, yeah. oh yeah, Ooh. Carrie, join the club, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah I, mean, I normally wear contacts, but you know I'm blind like the rest of you. Let's go solidarity. My prescription's right. pl plus four. Oh really? That's actually kind of high. Like, my, well, mine is plus mine is minus seven. So, I mean, that's way worse. Oh. But. Wait, how can you call mine high if? if you're <laughs> because like it's, Wait, it's, okay, it's I'm, I'm absolute value. nearsighted, so I think that's plus. No, I think nearsighted is minus. Oh, it's minus. Then I'm minus oh, four. Actually, actually, now that I think about it, I don't really know. I'm also nearsighted, so whatever you are, I am as well. Well, you're likely I, I, I not think... farsighted. Farsighted is, I would assume, far, farsighted is pretty rare. Yeah, yeah, like everyone is nearsighted. Yeah, like, I think I think most, most people are nearsighted. Which makes when you're sense. old though, when you're old, you're farsighted. Yeah, I think my dad is developing oh, farsightedness right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Anyway, this is not this is not the glasses podcast. That was just a meme. We'll see you all <laughs> next week. Ta -ta. We'll see bye you bye. With, with clear eyes. Bye. I don't know if we'll bye. see you with clear eyes. But... Boo -da -boo -da. Later.